in, in the study of, of uh, Diophantine equations, there are two kinds of theorems. There are results where you try to show that rational points do not exist, so that there are few rational points. And there are results, I mean, there are theorems where you try to show that rational points have to exist. So a, a typical example is what comes out of the circle method. Of course, the circle method is concerned with equations where there are many variables, where the number of variables is large relative to the degree. So it doesn't really apply to the case of curves, where essentially we have only one, one variable. But uh, for curves, for the characteristics strictly positive or equal to zero, we're going to see that actually we, ha we, we can strive at least to obtain results of a similar nature, sort of existence results on, on, on actually constructing rational points. And that's going to be sort of the main, the, the main goal, I guess, in, in this week, and to explain that in this week's lectures. So uh, I'm going to begin then. Uh, let E be an elliptic curve. So a, a curve of genus 1 equipped with a rational point over k. So an elliptic curve over a number field k. Okay. So, a, uh, so that's a curve of genus 1 with a, a rational point, which I call the origin. And then well, once I do that, that, that curve is endowed with a natural structure of an algebraic group, as we, we already saw or discussed uh, many times last week. So, um, so we want to understand, of course, uh, so the question is to study uh, the group E of K, or uh, more ambitiously, the set of groups E of L, maybe as L ranges over all the finite extensions of K. Even infinite, if you want, of course. OK, so that's what we want to do. Now, the most basic result on the subject, of course, is the well-known Mordell-Weil theorem, which asserts that this group is finitely generated. So, Mordell-Weil theorem. Um, the group E of K is a finitely generated abelian group. So, i.e., uh, we can write E of k as a direct sum, non-canonically, but as a direct sum of a certain number of copies of z, r copies of z, and a finite subgroup. Uh, this one is canonical. This is the torsion subgroup, okay? So, the cardinality of t is finite. Okay. So, I mean, that's clearly the basic finiteness result in the subject. I'm going to say a few words shortly about the proof. But the point I want to make now first is that, okay, so we know a lot. We know a lot about T. Well, in fact, we already saw that last week, of course, in the lectures of Marussia Reboledo, who discussed Mehrel's theorem. We know that there exists a constant. So the cardinality of T uh, is bounded by a constant which depends only, in fact, on the number of field k. In fact, even more, only on the degree of k over q. Okay? And in any case, for the game we're playing now, where you fix an elliptic curve and you try to study this torsion group, there are very good algorithms, very efficient procedures for calculating t given e and k. So somehow, from the point of view of the kind of questions I want to discuss this week, the group T holds little mystery. But, um, so the real mystery is uh, in understanding R. So the, the, the sort of the mystery in the theory of elliptic curves is sort of to understand the variation in the rank. I'll mention shortly a few natural questions. I mean, uh, for example, how does one compute effectively R and so on and so forth. So this is really the sort of invariant, which is subtle, and which we'd like to get some kind of control over. Now, uh, before doing that, maybe I'll um, just, I want to say a few words about the proof of the modal weil theorem. Okay. So, some words about the proof. I'm not going to go into the details. Uh, so, I mean, the idea is, and in fact, I mean, this was already implicit in some of the exercises I assigned uh, last Monday. When we, so, I mean, 
the idea is to, ex so to exploit the fact that the elliptic curve E is equipped with many unramified coverings to itself. Namely, by virtue of the fact that it's a group, the multiplication by n map is uh, a nice etal cover from E to itself over spec k. Uh, but in fact, uh, this, ma this even extends to a, a smooth morphism over the spectrum of the ring of integers where we invert the primes of bad reduction, the primes dividing delta, and the primes dividing n. Okay. So uh, last week, we kind of saw that if you had an unramified covering of curves, y to x, we could exploit essentially the fact that any rational point would have a, uh, the fiber of any rational point would, would have a bounded ramification to, to prove results like if the curve upstairs is more delicate, then the curve downstairs has to be more delicate. So sort of from bounding rational points here, you can get bounds on the rational points of the curve downstairs. Now, of course, these are both curves of the genus 1. And we don't, so neither in general has finitely many rational points. But we can use exactly the same idea to bound the group of rational points over k modulo the image. So it's the same idea. Okay? Um, but I want to kind of ma maybe make this a little bit explicit and sort of introduce some vocabulary, the vocabulary of descent, which I'm going to be using tomorrow and on Wednesday when I discuss the underlying proof behind, I mean, the underlying, the ideas behind the proof of Kohli Wagen's theorem. So I want to kind of have a, f a few uh, uh, notions uh, behind my belt. So the way that one kind of phrases this argument in uh, modern language is to consider the so-called uh, well, Kummer exact sequence, the multiplication by n map on the elliptic curve, which as a morphism of algebraic curves is surjective. So if you want over, over, over k bar, it's a surjective map. And the kernel is the uh, module of n torsion points uh, of E defined over uh, k bar. Now we can take the Galois invariance of this exact sequence. Um, so we take the GK invariance. And what we get, OK, I'm going to start here. I don't really partic particularly care about this. OK, this kernel is going to be small, the invariance of uh, EN over, over K, the, the K rational points of EN. So I get the following exact sequence, E of K goes under multiplication by n to e of k. But of course, this uh, is not exact anymore, right? That's the whole point. That's a, certainly a basic example where you can see that the functor of taking invariance is not exact on the, on the right. And so there's a co-kernel, which is the first cohomology of uh, the Galois the cohomology, h1 of gk, with values in this Galois module en. And the co-kernel of this map is uh, the n torsion. OK, I could continue. I would get the h1 here and the h1 there. So it's the h1 of gk with values in e, or in e of k bar, but uh, the elements which are killed by n. So this is actually exactly a subjective map. And um, of course, in this exact sequence, everything is, is fairly clear. The important map to understand is this one, which is called delta. OK, so what we have then is a natural injection from E of k mod n E of k into H1 of g k E n, um, H1 e n torsion. So we have this sort of fundamental three-term exact sequence, which embeds the group we're interested in into this kind of Galois cohomology group. Now, this argument I, I made, of course, applies to any field. I could have done the same thing over the various completions of k. And so I have a corresponding local exact sequence for every completion of k. So I have so-called, I mean, corresponding local connecting homomorphism to the Galois cohomology uh, En. And the co-kernel is likewise. Yeah, an E of GKV, E, N. 
And uh, the, the natural embedding of K into its completions induces natural maps like that. So, I mean, the idea would be, okay, I mean, if we could show that this group were finite, for example, then that would give us immediately that this quotient is finite and that would give what's known as the weak Mordell Weil theorem, that E of K mod N E of K is finite, okay? Um, well, unfortunately, this group is not, it's, it's actually rather large and infinite, but we can try to cut down its size by imposing various local conditions. So considering only the classes, which when you look locally, look like they come from points, I mean, or do come from points, over the various completions. In other words, taking the classes which are in the kernel of this map. Okay? And that's what's called the Selmer group. Okay? So the N Selmer group of E over K is the kernel of the natural map from H1 of, okay, instead of writing GK, I'll use the standard convention from now on and write H1 of K with values in EN. Okay, that means the same thing. We've seen that already a number of times. The natural map to H1 of KE V, uh, sorry, H1 of KVE and torsion, where I take the direct sum over all V. Okay. So then uh, uh, there are two kind of stages in showing that this group here is finite. The first is to show that the n Selmer group of E over K is contained in a subgroup of this H1, which I'll denote by H1 sub n delta of K E n, which is just the classes which are unramified outside n delta. And that's sort of We've seen this kind of argument a number of times. I mean, the point is that if you take a point, uh, maybe I should say, I mean, this, this is an exercise that if you haven't seen it before, you should definitely do. So it's to write down delta, okay? Write down a specific formula for delta. I'll give it to you, in fact. So if you take delta and you evaluate it on a point, you get a function on the Galois group. And what is delta of p evaluated on sigma? Well, it's just b, p tilde applied, to, I mean, sigma applied to p tilde minus p tilde where n times p tilde is equal to p. So you just choose a p tilde, which is a lift of this point p under this map, multiplication by n, and then you sort of study the failure of this point to be defined over k, which is measured by this co-cycle. Okay, that's, that's the formula for delta. And what you see from that is that, um, well, I mean, you, you can make a local analysis that I see that these, these co-cycles are unramified outside the primes dividing n delta. Okay, so that's the first point in the proof. And then you make a global analysis, and H1 n delta uh, of k e n is finite. That follows from the theorem of Hermite by exactly the same kind of arguments that we saw last week. We, we, we saw this kind of thing a number of times. You have uh, these closed cycles essentially correspond to finite extensions of the field of n division points with bounded ramification, and so therefore there have to be finitely many of them. That's sort of the flavor of the argument, and that leads to the conclusion that E of k mod n e of k is finite. So we've done this by embedding into the summer group, which is this sort of Galois theoretic object. Uh, yeah, you have a question? Well, uh, I don't know what to say. I mean, uh, we saw this a number of times last week. We discussed, uh, I mean, I've used this word unramified in the concept a number of times. And if I, if, I, if I really go into the details now, I'll, I'll, I'll run over time. Yeah. Yes, for this, yes. I mean, I'm, I'm glossing over some details here. I mean, you see, well, I mean, I have an embedding of K in, into KV, right, which is a natural embedding. But then you're right that if I want to look at uh, what is this map from GK to GKV, it's obtained by, it's a restriction map. So I have to also choose an embedding of k bar into kv bar. And there, there, are, no, there are many choices, but all these are defined up to conjugation. So you just choose one for each v. Is that not independent It's independent of the choice. For that, you'll just have to trust me. I mean, take my word for it. <laughs> okay. So, um, <coughs> 
OK, so, so, that, so that's what's called the weak uh, Mordell-Weil theorem. Of course, this is only half the proof, because uh, we, we, in order to show that E of k is finally generated, we have to have some kind of discreteness statement about the group of rational points. Uh, so the, the extra ingredients is heights. So there's a, the notion of heights on this group, which sort of tells us that the group has the right kind of discreteness property that we can then conclude uh, finite generation from this. I insist on the, on the, on the first half, the, the, the weak mornell Bay theorem, because that's what's going to come up later in my, my talks. In a, in a sense, it's, the, it's really the sticky point in the proof of, uh, of the mornell Bay theorem. That's where somehow the lack of effectivity, I'll, I'll discuss this more a bit later, I think. I mean, so it sort of underlies our, our basic approach to, to, to understanding E of k is to embed it in the Selma group. So now maybe I should say that we have this exact sequence um, which embeds. So having cut down, taking this n Selma group, we have the exact sequence which maps the group of k rational points modulo n to the n Selma group of E over k. And the kernel is the so-called Schaffrevich Tate group, which you've certainly seen a number of times in various guises in various of the other lectures in the last two weeks. And the Sha of E over K, oh, sorry, the n torsion of Sha, right? Where the Sha of E over K is the kernel of H1KE into the natural, um, the natural map into the direct sum of the H1KVE. And this is identified with the the curves of genus 1, which locally are isomorphic to E, which locally have a rational point over each completion, but, uh, well, do not have, but are not isomorphic. The isomorphism class is over K of such curves of genus 1. And so that's the sort of basic exact sequence. So this is the object which you can try to compute. In various descent arguments, we try to compute this and thereby obtain bounds on E of K minus N E of K. On the other hand, we can certainly try to find points by exhaustive search or so on. And we hope that these two processes of bounding E of K from above and from below are eventually going to converge. And the obstruction to making a firm statement in that direction is precisely this group, understanding this mysterious Schaffrevich Tate group. What did I say? Oh, yes, yes, uh, sorry, kernel of this. Yeah, I didn't finish what I was writing, yeah. Okay. And uh, the, the direct sum over V, yeah. No, no, so, okay, so this is actually, okay, I can write the direct product if you want, but it's, it's, it's a fact that uh, um, this actually maps into the direct sum. So if you have a principal homogeneous space, it's going to acquire local points almost everywhere. So this is going to be zero. If, if I had the n inside, of course, it would be different story, right? The Selma group, uh, so for the Selma group, I hope I wrote, yeah, I did write it. I, I, here I also have the, you know, the n after. So I think it's okay that I wrote. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about uh, Mordell Vey, about the proof of Mordell Vey. We'll be going back to that when I talk about Kuli Wagen tomorrow. Now, um, so maybe let me write down some of the fundamental questions in the subject. So the first maybe is to decide when R is zero. Okay, so get a criterion that'll tell us that uh, the rank is positive, that there are infinitely many rational points on the K rational points on the elliptic curve, give a nice criterion. The second, which is in line with some of the, the computational themes in this, uh, in this, in this uh, summer school, and anyway, is uh, certainly a the fundamental problem anyway in the theory of elliptic curves, is the problem of computing R. So you're handed the elliptic curve and the number field, and you actually want to compute uh, E of K, or co compute the rank, maybe compute a system of rational points, I mean, maybe compute R and maybe a system of generators, P1 up to ER, generators for the group E of K modulo its torsion subgroup, for example. So those are sort of fundamental problems which you don't know how to do, uh, in this case coming from the fact that we can't really control the, this, this Schaffrevich Tate group and prove its finiteness, for example. So what, what little we know about these questions, um, well, is formulated in the Bertrand and Dyer conjecture. So I want to now explain the version of the conjecture, which already made kind of a cameo appearance, I mean, actually an important appearance last week when we discussed Mazur's theorem and gave a criterion for the finiteness of uh, various quotients of J naught of P. Okay? 
So I'm, but now I'm going to try to kind of be a little bit more systematic in, in the explaining the Bertrand to Dyer conjecture. So the, the basic insight, so let me just now to simplify, suppose that the ground field K is the field of rational numbers, OK? Just to, to simplify my notations. And nothing I'm going to say here is really essentially tied to Q. Well, so the basic insight is that we would like to kind of say that there's a kind of local global principle. So for every prime P, say not dividing delta, we can define uh, the number NP by counting the number of points on the elliptic curve over the finite field with P elements. And the basic feeling is that if the rank is large, then that means there are many rational points. And by reduction mod P, this rational point should contribute systematically to the size of E of FP. So the, we would sort of think that the NPs would be, tend to be rather larger when uh, the rank is large. So uh, that was sort of a, what, what got the Birch and Swinner and Dyer the, sort of the, the, their initial insight. And what they did is they considered the following partial products, the product over all the primes less than some capital X of uh, NP over P. And the, the heuristic observation they made was that this grows like a, certain, like a constant, depending on E, which in any case they weren't able to determine really precisely, times a certain power of log X. And the power that came up appeared to be the rank. So they did this calculation for various elliptic curves whose rank they knew in advance. And this was just a heuristic observation. So this was based on, on numerical calculations uh, by, by Birch and Swinton Dyer on a number of elliptic curves. So this is an instance of a kind of local global principle because it tells you that the, the NPs, which encode local information about the elliptic curve, somehow know about this global invariant R, the rank. Okay. So there's a sort of more, um, well, there's a more useful way, more sophisticated, but more useful way of formulating this kind of basic insight in terms of L functions. So we associate to E the Hasse L function, which I also mentioned last week in connection with the Bielian varieties um, and elliptic representations. Um, this made an appearance in, the, in, the, in our discussion of, uh, of Mazur's proof. Um, so the Hasse L function of the elliptic curve is defined as an Euler product over all the primes not dividing delta. So here delta I'll take the, to be the minimal discriminant, assuming that E has minimal form somehow. 1 minus AP P to the minus S plus P to the 1 minus 2S inverse, where AP is just uh, the discrepancy between the number of points mod P and P plus 1. OK, uh, there's this. And then when, uh, when completes it for the primes dividing delta, there's a formula of this shape where AP, in this case, is 0 or plus or minus 1, okay. depending on the kind of bad reduction that the elliptic curve requires. It doesn't really, it's not very important. But maybe the, uh, I mean, to, to motivate this definition from a naive point of view and connect it with what I wrote here, okay, you could observe, well, so I mean, there are two facts about this elliptic curve, about this L function. So, uh, LES converges for the real part of S bigger than 3 halves. And this is an exercise, well, I already gave this exercise last week when I discussed the L functions attached to abelian varieties or elliptic representations, when I made the statement that the elliptic representations were what I called rational. And that came along with a bound on, on the Frobenius eigenvalue. And uh, in this context, it means that the, these coefficients AP are less than 2 square root p in absolute value. And from that, you can make this conclusion about the absolute convergence of this product on a the plane to the right of uh, s equals 3 halves. So OK, but if you look formally, so if you do something which is completely illegal because you're outside the domain of convergence, but if you expand Le1 formally, you'll, you'll find that you get the product of p over np over all p, more or less, right? Just plug in s equals 1. So um, the idea is that, the, the, OK, from that, 
you kind of uh, postulate that the, the behavior of the SL function at s equals 1 reflects something about the size or the asymptotics of the growth of, these, of, this pro of the partial products, the corresponding partial products. OK? Um, and, and so that's what kind of motivates, maybe with the help of some hindsight, the Bertrand and Dyer conjecture, as I'm going to state it now. Um, okay, so what is this? So there are two conjectures. Well, OK, I mean, so um, yeah, well, let me just write the conjecture in the following way. So conjecture BSD. So I should say that, I mean, this, uh, this L series, which I defined for Q, there's a similar kind of thing where you could define it, uh, the Hasseve L series of the elliptic curve over K, OK, is similarly defined. You just, instead of. Um, Taking the order product over the rational primes, it would take the order product over all the primes of k. Okay, so it's the same idea. And so the Bertrand and Dyer conjecture is that this L series has an analytic continuation. And the order of vanishing at s equals 1 of the L function L of E over K S is equal to the rank of the more elevated group E of K. So this R that appears in the decomposition of so the sort of the minimal number of generators you need to, to generate E of K. So that's a Bertrand and Dyer conjecture. There's also a yeah. Yeah, but uh, formally, yeah. I mean maybe I put it on in quotes. I mean OK, it's really just a, a kind of a Yes, uh, right. Uh, yeah, because you see what you're picking up in, in the, the experiments of version desire, the NP came in the numerator. Here, when someone is sort of getting the inverse of that. So if this kind of asymptotically grows fast, then this one should sort of, if this kind of diverges, uh, so this one should sort of diverge to zero, this product. And it, sh and it should diverge to zero sort of more quickly the larger the rank R is. So it translates into the statement about the order of vanishing. I mean, that's sort of a metaphysical thing because, of course, it. No, and, uh, no. I just, th th yeah, this is a taking up as a product over primes. And likewise, this L function is taken over uh, as a product over the finite primes. I think so. Yeah, I think that that was part of their. I mean, this probably. Pre, I mean, this certainly predated Bertrand and Dyer. The expectation that uh, these L series would have analytic continuations. I'm, I'm sort of stating it as part of the conjecture, um, although yeah, it's kind of really too. I mean, we saw yeah, we saw this conjecture uh, last week for elliptic curves over Q on Friday. That's just the Shimura Taniyama conjecture. And sort of the natural generalization. This first thing is sort of the natural generalization of Shimura Taniyama over number of fields, which, which is certainly believed, I mean, to be true. And I'll be saying some, some more in the next days about sort of, you know, okay, so anyway, let me, let me now say something about, uh, yeah, I mean, also, uh, <coughs> this is the uh, statement of BSD as it appears in the Clay uh, website in the million dollar, so this is the Clay Summer School. I'll, I'll leave it at that, right? There's a more precise version which also uh, uh, expresses the leading term of this L series in terms of various invariants associated to the elliptic curve, including the order of this conjecturally finite Shafrovich state group. But, so I'll suppress that. I mean, this would already be kind of a major advance and, and would earn you a million dollars if you can prove that. So um, uh, let's see. So, uh, so, so what do we know about this? And in, in the next, uh, until Wednesday, I'll be placing myself 
in the context where the field of definition is, is Q. So from now on, I'm really going to seriously assume that the ground field is the field of rational numbers. Okay? And so in that case, it turns out we know quite a bit about this Richard and Dyer conjecture, although there's still also a lot that we don't know. But so, so the first theorem is the one that we saw last Friday. Theorem. Um, Wiles uh, and a number of other people. I mean, uh, the, the last uh, result in this direction, we sort of finished this line of inquiry was a result of Bray, Conrad, Diamond, Taylor. And I, I should also put the name of Hecke here. I mean, uh, so the, the, the L series then, the Hasevi L series LES, does have an analytic continuation. So we at least can talk sort of legitimately about the behavior of this function at s equals 1. That's the first result we know. Uh, so this is a general result about. And the second theorem, which uh, follows by combining two different pieces of work, one by Gross-Saguier and the other by coley wagen is that we know this BSD conjecture if the order of vanishing of the L function is not too large. So if the order of vanishing at s equals 1 of LES is less than or equal to 1, then BSD is true. Namely, the rank of E over Q is exactly what it's predicted to be by the BSD conjecture, the 0 or 1, as the case may be. Those are the two main results we have about the Bridgman and Dyer conjecture. So we know it for small analytic ranks. And uh, I guess there are two directions where we can try to go further. One is to uh, try to tackle the case of higher analytic rank over Q which seems extremely difficult. And the other is to try to uh, extend this result to number fields, uh, which is what I'll be discussing maybe on, uh, in the last few days of this week. So um, the key notion for understanding these two results is the notion of modularity, which I already explained, introduced and explained last week. OK, so. Um, So uh, the key, um, what do I want to say? A key, um, the key, I mean, the key to both results, OK? This is really the key to, to both uh, results, both the, this theorem of Wiles and so on, and the theorem of gross aguirre is the connection with modular forms. So that was the theorem of Wiles, which I stated, I, I mean Wiles and these others in this. So Wiles proved it for semi-stable elliptic curves, and then there were a number of uh, refinements of the technique, and eventually that led to showing that all elliptic curves were connected to modular forms in the sense I'm about to, uh, to state. So the statement is that if E over Q is an elliptic curve over uh, of conductor N, then there is a normalized eigenform of weight 2 on the Hecke congruence group gamma not of N. So we saw uh, last week what, th what these things mean, such that Uh, e is isogenous to the about abelian ver well, the, the abelian variety quotient. In this case, it's an elliptic curve quotient. A sub f is isogenous to a sub f, which remember uh, is the quotient of j zero of n associated to. Um, uh, to f by the eichler shimura construction, which I described last week. Okay. 
So, um, so consequences of that. So we. Well, the first was one that we already, I mean, that we, I mean part of the Aishwashimura construction we saw was that, I mean, when you look at the, the Hasse VL series of this abelian variety quotient, you get uh, the Hecke L series attached to the modular form, okay? So the first consequence is that the L series of E, which is, I mean, it's the same as the Hasse VL series of AF because these are isogenous elliptic curves, and this is equal to the Hecke L series associated to the modular form, which is just the sum of a n n to the minus s, uh, n going from 1 to infinity, where, I mean, these are the, the Fourier coefficients of the modular form f. Another way of writing it, uh, well, I mean, uh, I guess uh, if, I take, if I look at 2 pi to the s, gamma of s, times L E S, okay? So I modify my, my L function by, by, by these factors. And someone asked me about uh, Archimedean, uh, about, the, about how we define the L function. So the L function is always defined as a product over the finite places of the number of fields. But when one wants to write down in a nice way the analytic properties, notably the functional equation, it's better to multiply by certain gamma factors. And these correspond in a precise way to sort of order factors at the infinite places. And so this completed product has a nice expression in terms of f. So it's the, the, essentially the Mellon transform, the integral from 0 to i infinity, f of, um, or maybe, yeah, yeah, 0 to i infinity, f of y, um, y over i to the s dy over y. I think, I mean, I might be off by a power of pi here. Right? I'm not sure. But this is more or less what it is. So you're expressing this L function essentially as a Mellon transform of this analytic function whose growth properties are well understood, and this integral converges for all values of s. And that gives the analytic continuation. So that was the idea of Hecke, that this Hecke L series has an analytic continuation. So this gives the analytic continuation. That's the first theorem of the L series of the elliptic curve. So that's why we know that the L series has an analytic continuation because uh, we know that it's A sub F for some modular form, F. But there's another uh, consequence. So that sort of explains why we know this first theorem. But what about the second? Well, there's another structure that comes along with this uh, modularity, which is the fact that we now know that our elliptic curve appears in the Jacobian of this modular curve, x naught of n, okay? So the second consequence is that there is a map, there is a morphism. Well, obviously, uh, I can embed the modular curve x naught of n in its Jacobian by uh, taking a point p to the degree, to the equivalence class of the degree zero divisor p minus infinity, where infinity is the, dis, dis, the, the distinguished cusp corresponding to i infinity. And then uh, by construction, a sub f is a quotient of j naught of n. It's what you get by modding out by an appropriate ideal in the endomorphism ring generated by, by the suitable heck operators. And then um, we, uh, I mean, the, the, the theorem of Wiles and so on and others is that this AF is isogenous to E. Let me assume for simplicity that it's actually equal, okay? I can always replace, for, for these various uh, arithmetic questions, I can always replace an elliptic curve by one which is isogenous to it without changing the questions in a, an essential way. So I'm going to actually assume here from now on that E is actually equal to this abelian variety A sub F. And so this is just a natural projection. Okay, and I'm going to call this map, this whole comp, comp, composite map, I'll call it phi, capital C. And so this phi is called the modular parameterization attached to E.
Okay. What is it? So, uh, no, it's a very interesting question. I mean, there's a lot known. It depends what you want to know, I guess. Uh, so, um, yeah, no, so those are very important questions uh, connected to the ABC conjecture and various other things. So there will be all sorts of wonderful consequences, diophantine consequences, if you could bound the degree of the modular parameterization sort of solely in terms of the conductor. Now. Uh, in Weil's, Weil's proof of the Shimura Taniyama conjecture, this, uh, this theorem that I stated here, is also based on understanding something about the degree of the modular parameterization. But what Weil's needs to do is to uh, relate this degree to an invariant um, that, um, that's related, to, I mean, so this degree can be related to, the, to a certain L function, to the value of a, the L function of the symmetric square of an elliptic curve. And what Wiles needs to do is re relate this L value, or the degree, that's the same thing, essentially, to the order of a certain Galois cohomology group. So it's a more modest goal because, I mean, you have these, these two invariants which I probably don't understand on their own somehow. The degree on the one hand, and the order of a certain uh, Galois cohomology group which is related to deformations of certain Galois representations. Neither are we to understand, but what Wiles is to relate the two and show that they're essentially equal, okay? Uh, but having a control solely in terms of the conductor would give a lot more arithmetic consequences about sort of ternary type Diophantine equations in the spirit of the various Fermi equations and generalized Fermi equations which we saw last week. That would be extremely interesting uh, because we would get much stronger results like ABC, but we're far from being able to do that. Yeah. I'll, That's exactly what I'll be saying now, actually. I'm going to say a few words about that. About, about sort of, I mean, basically what you're asking is sort of how we can actually understand this fee and maybe compute it eventually in terms of. Yeah. There's some other comments? No. Okay. So, yeah, so this is called the modular parameterization, and I want to kind of make a comment about how you compute it. Yes. So, computing fee. Well, so um, it's a fact. That if, uh, okay, maybe let, to be safe, let me assume that n is square free. I'm not completely sure about the, the okay. So the fact is that if we take the, di the neuron differential on the elliptic curve, so omega e is the neuron differential, So it's, it's d, sort of dx over y, but for a particular well-chosen equation, which has reduction as much as it can. Then the pullback of this neuron differential is the differential associated to the modular form, f, which is 2 pi i, f of z dz, um, which I can also write as the sum, n equals 1 to infinity, of a n q to the n dq over q. Okay, so this, was, this fact was already used by Marussia Reboledo in her lecture when she gave uh, the explicit criterion for formal immersion uh, of the map from J0 of N to these quotients. So if you remember, she used the fact that if, when you have differentials on, this, um, on various quotients of J0 of N, uh, they pull back to sort of normalized eigenforms. So you can take the first Fourier coefficient to be one, or at least to be a unit in the, in the ring uh, which she called Z, okay, which was a, a reduction of, um, so, yeah. Yeah, so there's a Manning constant, exactly. There's this Manning constant which, so uh, am I saying something which is not quite correct? I think it's known to be one. What's the status, no? Uh, but it, sorry, I don't understand. So, okay, I mean, so yeah, so uh, 
OK, what you can say for sure, without uh, working hard, is that this, uh, this, uh, this pullback is a certain constant times this omega f. I mean, you can show that the heck operators act on this uh, pullback in the right way, so that it belongs to the same line. The question is, what is this constant? Now, this constant is uh, certainly in the case of uh, gamma naught of p, which was discussed by Mahousia. In the, in the original paper of Maser, it was known to be a power of 2. OK, so we knew enough about this. So there were problems in characters too. But I believe that now this has all been sorted out. No? You're not. So what's known? I mean, plus or two? It, so it could be two. OK. So, OK, I mean, so there's a C here, which is either plus or minus one or plus or minus two. I see. Anyway, it's, OK, it doesn't really matter. It's, it's believed to be uh, plus or minus one, I guess. So this is the, sto this is the story, OK? So the pullback of omega, of, of omega E is this, uh, this explicit modular form, this the differential associated to this form of weight two. And therefore, we can compute the image of tau. So, so, so we can get an analytic formula, analytic formula for phi of tau, where tau belongs to the upper half plane. And the analytic formula is this. Well, OK, what is uh, phi of tau? I'm going to sort of write down, rather than phi of tau, I'm going to write the integral uh, from uh, 0 to phi of tau of this uh, neuron differential omega e, which is the, the complex number in C modulo the neuron lattice, which corresponds to the elliptic curve, right, to the rational point on the elliptic curve. And this is just the integral from 0 to tau of the form omega f, if you grant me uh, this Manning constant business. And then this is just, um, you just compute the integral in this convenience since we know the a n. So this is just the sum of a n over n, q to the n, n equals 1 to infinity. And uh, I should say that we have completely explicit expressions, of course, for these a n's. Because these a n's are exactly the same coefficients that occur in the Hasse VL series of the elliptic curve, which is essentially the product over p of 1 minus a p, p to the minus s, plus p to the 1 minus 2 s inverse. Okay, So these coefficients, you can compute them concretely by counting the number of points on the elliptic curve over various finite fields. You package them together in this generating series, and then you get this formula for uh, the modular parameterization. So as a map of uh, curves over C, if you view x naught of n as being the quotient of uh, the upper half plane by gamma naught of n, you have a very nice formula for this map. Okay? Even if you can't write down an equation for x naught of n, which is rather hard to do in general. Yeah. This does not depend on? No, it depends on tau. I mean, I, tau is my, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, q is e to the 2 pi i tau, yes. Yeah, now it's not the formal thing. It's, I'm, I'm plugging in this value of q, and I'm getting a complex number. I mean, so this q is now really on the, on the open unit disk in the, comple in the complex plane. OK, so I mean, what's the, <coughs> so this map is a, so, it's a, it's, so phi is a, a map of algebraic curves defined over q. OK, but, but it's very hard to write down an equation for x of n over the rationals. But on the other hand, there's also sort of explicit control over this map as a map of curves over C via the identification of this with H mod gamma naught of n. Now, uh, the main use of this modular parameterization arises via the theory of complex multiplication. And that's the next thing I want to treat. I mean, so you see, now that you have this map from the modular curve to an elliptic curve, a strategy you could adopt for computing rational points on the elliptic curve is to try to find rational points on the modular curve, and then map them over to E. Now, of course, that kind of strategy is doomed because uh, these modular curves x naught of n are curves of higher genus. And we kind of know from faultings that there are very few, ra I mean, we know that rational points on curves of higher genus are very scarce. So, so there are very few of them. And also, from Mesa's result, we sort of bounded the number of rational points on x naught of n as n gets large. And we kind of expect that there are no, we, we know, in fact, that there are no rational points for n large enough. So, um, so, okay, but anyway, 
you, you st still try to do this. You look at x lot of n, map to E. And the question is to find rational or algebraic points on the modular curve x naught of n. And these would give rise to algebraic points on the elliptic curve by, by virtue of uh, the fact that this p is defined over the rationals. Now, we know from the start that if we are successful in making such collections of rational points, they're going to have to be defined over larger and larger fields, fields of larger and larger degree, probably because, well, maybe not. But anyway, so, so that's, that, that's sort of the, the, the idea. That's the strategy. Once you have a, an algebraic point on the elliptic curve, then you're kind of in good shape because thanks to the group law, you can look at the sum of all the Galois conjugates of that point, and you have at least a hope of manufacturing a rational point on E once you've made an algebraic point. So uh, that's the idea. And so then you ask yourself, what are sort of the, 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 um, what are the uh, algebraic points on exon of n that we know about? And the answer is, of course, the CM points, the points which correspond to moduli of elliptic curves with extra structure, namely with uh, somewhat, somewhat larger endomorphism rings that we could. So I want to now talk about CM points, CM points, and Hagner points. So let me fix a K, a quadratic imaginary field. OK, so I take a quadratic imaginary field, I mean a field that you obtain from the rationals by joining the square root of a negative uh, integer d. So d is positive. And uh, I give myself an embedding of this uh, quadratic extension of q into the complex numbers. And then the main result, the main theorem, is that uh, if I take a point tau in the upper half plane, which also has coordinates in this quadratic imaginary field, then it's Im the image of this tau under phi is actually uh, an algebraic point. Then phi of tau belongs to E of, k. in fact, it belongs to an algebraic extension of k, but it's an abelian extension of k. So it belongs to E of k ab, where k ab is the maximal abelian <laughs> extension of this quadratic imaginary field K. So I should say here that I'm, I'm identifying phi with its analytic realization as a map from the upper half plane to the complex points of the elliptic curve. Viewed in this way, phi is a highly transcendental map. So you kind of expect that if you start with a tau, which is algebraic, you would get a phi of tau, which is transcendental. And that's essentially true with this key exception, that for quadratic imaginary rationalities, you get ra algebraic points, in fact, points defined over abelian extension. OK, so it's quite a striking result about the algebraic nature of these values. And we'll be hearing a lot about CM points uh, in the coming lectures, uh, uh, notably, uh, I, I guess, on the, yeah, I mean, the, the lectures of John Voigt tomorrow or Wednesday are going to talk about some arithmetic applications of these. Oh, OK, wait, sorry. Yes, that's, that's known. That's a theorem, uh, yeah. It's known, I mean, so for values of the modular function j, it's known that, uh, w w which is exactly what you need for this, right? So it's known that uh, if tau is algebraic and not quadratic irrationality, then, then j of tau is transcendental. OK. Um, what do we want to see? Now, uh, maybe so tomorrow I'll def maybe define these points a little bit more carefully. So I'm running a little bit of time, so I'm going to kind of just make a little s summary of what I want to talk about tomorrow. Okay, so what we'll do tomorrow is we'll define a bit more carefully these uh, systems of CM points, and we'll uh, prove two main theorems about them. Okay.
So tomorrow we'll see that for certain k, for certain judiciously chosen quadratic imaginary fields, we can obtain, and for certain values of tau also that are well chosen, we can obtain a point uh, p in, um, well, you see, it, it, it wouldn't be reasonable uh, to expect that we would always obtain points uh, on exon of n over k, because that would sort of give you uh, many degree two points over k. But we can obtain points over the Hilbert class field, uh, which I'll call p1, on x naught of n of h. And um, or maybe, let me call it q, I guess, q1. And then I'm, I can define a point, pk, by taking the trace from h down to k of this point um, phi of the image of this point q1 under the modular parameterization. So I have a point, a CM point on x naught of n, whose coordinates are in the Hilbert class field. I take the trace down to k of the image of this under phi. And I get a point, therefore, in E of k. And so there are two, the two basic theorems about these points. This is this point, I'll explain its construction tomorrow, is called a Hegner point associated to the imaginary quadratic field k. So there are two results that we know about these. Uh, the image under phi, exactly. So I take this point q1. I look at its image under phi. I get a point on E of h, because phi is defined over q, and this point is defined over h. Then I trace this point. No, no, q is defined over h, right? No, no, but now I've traced. So this point, which is in E of h, I've taken its trace down to k. So trace means I look at the sum of the Galois conjugates for the action of Galois of h over k. So I look at the sum of these points, and this is going to be a point over k. Yes, yes. Tau is defined over k, but q is not. No, no, so this is important to, to kind of insist on. You see, in this theorem, right, when I write that uh, x naught of n over c is identified with h mod gamma naught of n, okay, this, is, uh, this isomorphism is analytic. It does not respect fields of definition, I mean, you know, so it's a remarkable fact that if you take a quadratic imaginary tau, it corresponds to an algebraic point here. This algebraic point is not defined over k, it's defined over an abelian extension. So I wrote here k ab. It's a certain abelian extension of k. So this tau, in this case, I mean, if we choose tau and k carefully, we can actually produce in this way a point on x naught of n, which is defined over the Hilbert class field. I should, I may, let me write it down. H is the Hilbert class field of K, which is a certain abelian extension. So it's the Hilbert class field of K. Mapping it down to E, I get a point in E of H. Then I tracing it down to K, I get a point in E of K. And we'll see two th key results about this, uh, this uh, uh, point PK. The first is a result of Gross-Zagier, which relates this P sub K to L series. And it says essentially that the first derivative of the Hasse A L series of E over K at one is equal to the narrow Tate height of this point PK times an explicit non-zero fudge factor. So the appearance of the gross Agui formula is this one. It says that these two quantities are related up to a non-zero factor, which means in particular that so the main consequence is that if L prime of E over K1 is non-zero, in other words, this L series has an order of vanishing one, then, um, uh, the, then PK is of infinite order. In fact, I guess this is a logical equivalence, okay? I mean, both things are equivalent because the point is of infinite order precisely if its neuron tate height is non-zero. So we have that. So we have a control over this, over this basic point via I mean, in terms of the L series, this way. That's the first theorem. I'll call that maybe theorem A. The second theorem, theorem B, 
is going to establish a connection between this point PK and the mordel Vey group of E over K. And the theorem, and this is due to Kohli-Wagen, is that if PK has infinite order, so if this method for producing a rational point on the elliptic curve works, then, in fact, uh, E of k is generated by this point. E of k modulo the group generated by pk is finite. So, I mean, you see, in the, in the Burstein and Dyer conjecture, you're trying to relate L series to um, to E of K, or to, you know, to E of Q, right? To Mordel Vey groups. And so the, the connection between those things is postulated by the Bergeron and Dyer conjecture. And what we're going to see tomorrow is that in the middle you have these sort of Hegner points. I'll explain how that connection is made tomorrow. And then what I'd like to do is to give you a, a good overview of the, I, I'll say very little about the theorem of gross Gauss-Aguirre, which is an essential part of the proof, but is a sort of a very computational component. So that this one I won't talk about much, but I'll try to give you some good account of uh, the methods of Kohli-Wagen, which are fairly general. And of course, I remind you that these results of Kohli-Wagen also play a key role in, I mentioned that uh, last week, in the proof of Mazur's theorem and certainly Merel's theorem as it was presented by Marussia Revoledo on Thursday. Okay, so thank you.